the six-year-old who became a civil rights hero. I thought I'd stumbled into a parade. Just by walking to school. Four very tall white men were standing at the door. Ruby Bridges remembers the day that changed America. I remember them chanting two, four, six, eight, we don't want to integrate. And see how this history maker is still at work today. We take racism and we pass it on to our kids. On today's 700 Club Interactive. Good morning and welcome to the program. More than one out of every five students reports being bullied. And half of bullying situations stop when someone, especially a peer, intervenes. Well, an Iowa principal is making a gutsy sacrifice to back up one of his students. Principal Tim Hadley recently shaved his head in front of the school students to support a child who was bullied after shaving his own head. The boy handling the razors is 11-year-old Jackson Johnston. The sixth grader shaved his head to support his grandfather who was diagnosed with cancer. Jackson says before his principal stepped in, he was bullied for his new look. Principal Hadley says he wanted to show the students that it's important to stand up for each other and support one another. Jackson is now feeling more confident and plans to continue shaving his head until his grandfather is in remission. Wow, kudos to both of them. And Principal Hadley yeah. really going above and beyond, wasn't it? I, mean, that's a, I, I, can, I can tell you that's a tough look sometimes. <laughs> so, I admire yeah. him for making we the choice. We try not to bully John Andrew here, but it's just... <laughs> sweet story, wasn't it? <laughs> really it's wonderful sweet to see that story. Support. Yes, and, and great to see a principal give a visual lesson yeah. to everybody in the school. That's Very powerful, awesome. much more than a lecture or something Amen. like that. Amen. <laughs> well, an expectant couple's post on the future arrival of their twins has been celebrated on social media by millions for their openness about infertility. Lauren and Gary Walker placed two onesies inside a circle of 452 needles that they used during in vitro fertilization treatment. Lauren shared that they had been trying to conceive and explain their inspirational journey, saying, we prayed for 953 days, 452 needles, thousands of tears, one corrective surgery, four Clomid letrozole attempts, two IVF rounds, three failed transfers, and wow. one amazing God. The Walkers are expecting a boy and a girl and plan to name them Duke and Diana. What a journey for them, yeah. Terry. You know, I think a lot of times if you haven't dealt with infertility yourself, you don't realize not only can that be a long process trying to, to find the answer and become pregnant, but painful. I mean, it's a commitment on every level. And even just casual conversation can be heartbreaking to a couple like mm -hmm. that in the process. Oh, well, we didn't have any trouble at all getting pregnant. Yes. You know, it's just another like discouragement. And, yes. and it's so wonderful. They're sharing their journey and people are celebrating with them. Absolutely. We congratulate you as well. Well, in other news, Spy Kids actress Alexa Panavega shared an emotional message with her fans on Instagram. The former child star revealed that her grandmother was hospitalized and was on life support after her lungs collapsed, her heart started failing, and her stomach stopped working. Alexa said she and her family prepared to say goodbye when local church members came and prayed over her grandmother for five hours. You gotta love that. Mm. And then her grandma woke up completely healed. The doctors have no explanation for her recovery and keep running tests to try to make sense of it all. But Alexa says she knows how her grandmother was healed, saying, quote, God's grace is what healed her. It's miracles like this that remind me of how great our God is. Power of prayer, Terry. Power of prayer. You know, to have a church family that would come and stand over yeah. someone who was really pretty much given up by the medical profession and just believe for God mm -hmm. to move is awesome. Dramatic pictures of her in yes. that hospital bed and then uh, yeah. after prayer, um, what doctors are seeing, what a wonderful testimony yeah, of the power you, of God. Mm -hmm. Well, coming up, she was one of the first African-American children to integrate into an all-white school. I remember them chanting, two, four, six, eight, we don't want to integrate. And they kept pointing at me and shouting. They kept saying, we're going to poison her. We're going to hang her. Ruby Bridges shares her history-making story. You don't want to miss it. It's next, right after this. Well, it's an iconic image of the civil rights movement. A painting by Norman Rockwell called The Problem We All Live With. The image depicts the day that six-year-old Ruby Bridges 
was escorted to school by four U.S. deputy marshals. That was 55 years ago, and today, Ruby still remembers it like it was yesterday. When we turned the corner, I saw all of these people. November 14th, 1960. It was six-year-old Ruby Bridges' first day of school at William France Elementary in New Orleans. I remember them chanting, two, four, six, eight, we don't want to integrate. It had been five years since the U.S. Supreme Court mandated the desegregation of schools. Now Washington was putting pressure on Louisiana and other states that had yet to comply. In a veiled attempt to appear compliant, city officials in New Orleans gave 150 black kindergartners an entrance exam, one they had no chance of passing. But six of the 150 passed that test. Ruby was one of them. Everybody was coming over and congratulating my parents. She's so smart, she passed, we're so proud of her. So I actually thought that I was so smart that I passed this test that would allow me to go from first grade to college. Three girls, including Ruby, were selected to attend William France Elementary. But by the first day, the other two girls had dropped out, making Ruby the only black student in the school. My parents only said, Ruby, you're gonna go to a new school today and you better behave. There was a knock at the door. My parents opened the door and four very tall white men were standing at the door. And I remember looking at them and thinking, well, who are they? Those four men were United States Marshals sent under order of President Eisenhower. Their job was to escort Ruby to and from school. One of the men was Charles Burks. Well, we had a lot of demonstrations against what we were doing. The main thing was just be sure nothing happened to her. So we'd tell her, just stay close to us. We'll be all right. There were barricades everywhere. There were cameras everywhere. I thought I'd stumbled into a parade. I actually thought it was Mardi Gras. It didn't seem to bother her any. She was just doing what she had been told to do. Ruby's mother went as well. Once inside, they were taken to the principal's office where they stayed all day. There, they watched white parents scramble in and out of classrooms, taking their children out of school. 500 kids walked out of school that day. And I didn't know what was going on because nobody explained anything to me. Finally, the bell rang and someone came into the office and they said, school is dismissed. You can leave. And I remember sitting there and thinking, wow, college is easy. <laughs> By the next day, the crowds had doubled. And they kept pointing at me and shouting. They kept saying, we're gonna poison her. We're gonna hang her. I was in favor of what we were doing. I knew what we were doing was right. And we were gonna make sure it happened. This time, Ruby was taken to a classroom. I remember looking into that classroom and all I saw was empty desk. I didn't see one child. But there was one person there, her teacher, Barbara Henry. Coming from Boston, she was the only one willing to teach Ruby. I remember looking at her and thinking, she's white. I'd never seen a white teacher before. She looked exactly like the people outside. She wasn't. I always say that she showed me her heart. The following week, students started to return. But the principal confined Ruby to her classroom and didn't allow her to play outside or eat in the cafeteria. I remember going to the back of the classroom to sharpen my pencil, and you could look onto the playground. There was these huge oak trees, swings and slides and basketball goals. And I kept thinking as I sharpened my pencil, where are the kids? By the end of the school year, the protests had disbanded, and Ruby was finally allowed to meet the other children. I finally found them, you know, and I was so excited. So I went in to play with them. Uh, this little boy looked at me and he said, I can't play with you. 
my mom said not to play with you because you're a nigger. So that's what this is about. It's not Mardi Gras. And this isn't college. It's about me. It's about me and the way I look and the color of my skin. And in my mind, that was okay. Yes, he hurt my feelings, but I wasn't angry with him because I felt like he was explaining to me why he couldn't play with me. If my parents said, Ruby, don't play with him, he's Asian, Hispanic, Indian, Muslim, white, mixed race, Jewish, gay, I would not have played with him. I didn't feel like there was anything for me to forgive. The fact that in my mind, he was explaining to me and that I would have done the same thing. It wasn't like I was angry with him, so there was nothing there to forgive. The fact that when I passed the crowd, I thought it was Mardi Gras. There was nothing there for me to forgive. Ruby returned the following year. She had a new teacher and a room full of classmates. She went on to attend an integrated high school and eventually graduated from Kansas City Business School with a degree in travel and tourism. And when she married and began raising a family, she taught her children to rely on God. She always falls on her faith and she makes sure that you do so as well. So it doesn't matter what you go through, it doesn't matter who hates you, who dislikes you. As long as you have that faith and that relationship with God, you're fine. Ruby returned to William France Elementary in 1993 when she enrolled her four nieces. She witnessed the same racism she had seen as a little girl. So to build bridges between the races, she volunteered as a parent liaison and established an after-school multicultural art club. Soon after, she launched the Ruby Bridges Foundation and began sharing her story with students all over the U.S. I see hope that most of us don't see. I'm in schools every day. I am so humbled by the way my story moves kids. It's so simple. How Mrs. Henry didn't judge me how all I wanted was a friend. Kids get that, they understand that. Our kids know nothing about racism. It's us as adults. We take racism and we pass it on to our kids. And that's why it's still around. Each and every one of us come into the world with a clean heart. I believe that if we are going to get past our racial differences, even today, it's gonna to come from our kids. It's been over 55 years since Ruby walked up those steps and took her place in history. Today, her legacy continues to make a difference. I was happy to see what she did because I knew it could be done. I've always told Ruby that. And I'm glad I was there, able to have something to do with it. To have equality, it takes someone with courage to make that change so that we can come together. And you have to have a, a great, faithful foundation to stand up for something that you truly believe. My superhero, she does that every day. Out of the commandments, if you could only keep one, the one you should keep is love thy neighbor. That is the key. And I have to care about you as a person and a human being. I really believe the longer I live that it really has everything to do with love. Well, that wraps it up in a nutshell, doesn't it? You talk about heroes in this country. Ruby Bridges and her family are true American heroes. Yeah. Terry, my daughter's almost six years old. Wow. And to consider... Can you imagine? No. Yeah, I And I got either. chills listening to the earlier part of the story when it was revealed she would be the only one attending. 
and to consider my daughter marching into that school by herself with the exception of four deputy marshals yeah. and the courage of that little girl and that family and to think it's only yeah. five decades ago. And that family, you know, I, I, I just marvel that had they not been strong, had they not said, you know what, Ruby can do this, you know what, we need to do this, we wouldn't be where we are today without people like that. Right. So in less than, than six decades, I mean, this has changed in the face of a nation. And we say thank you to Ruby and to her family and to others like them who've made a difference and who've done it in love. You know, here's a woman who could have been bitter, she could have been angry, and instead she did something positive with it that's changing all kinds of lives. Great. Well, still to come, a young girl is abused and abandoned. I felt like I was nothing. See how a local church not only changed her life, but transformed an entire orphanage when we come back. Children are supposed to be protected and loved, but that is not always the case. We want you to meet three children. They're all from Kenya, they're all orphans, and at one time they all cried for freedom. They have come from utter poverty and despair. They liken their journey to the Israelites breaking out of bondage, and it's a fitting comparison. Their orphanage was run by a group of corrupt individuals who were pocketing the money instead of providing for the children. The orphans were eating stale and moldy food, had no uniforms to go to school, and were always fearful of the drunken night guard who would hit them. All this combined with their own issues of childhood abandonment and loss. Eric's father died when he was three. A year later, his mother committed suicide. Alice lost her father at age three. That's when her mother started beating her. Eunice's parents died when she was four and nine. She was passed between relatives, but nobody seemed to have the money to care for her. I felt like I was nothing. And even when I see other children, I saw them better than me. Eunice remembers she wished then that she had never been born. Eric's aunt used to beat him because she didn't want him in their home. One day, she dropped him at the orphanage. Understandably, he had a lot of anger inside. At that time, I wanted to be a police officer, to beat people thoroughly. I thought of being a teacher so that I can beat up children the way my mom used to beat me. Alice lived with beatings for eight years before social workers brought her to the orphanage. But conditions there weren't much better, and she planned to run away. I was thinking of going and living there at the streets instead of living such a horrible life. Conditions at the orphanage reached a crisis point. One night, the drunken caretaker allowed a rapist gang into the compound. But neighbors heard, the police were called, and the attack was stopped. Without any knowledge of the ongoing abuse and neglect, members of a local church came to visit. When they saw the extent of the need, they reached out with food, clothing, and encouragement. In a very unusual decision, authorities asked the church to take over the orphanage. Orphan's Promise came alongside the local church, providing immediate funds to get the children into school. The partnership of Orphan's Promise has helped us take these children out of a very deep pit. We could not believe our ears when the pastors made this announcement. Like a dream, things started changing. Good meals, new uniform, new shoes, new clothes, and we were able to go back to school and that is when we started living, not surviving. And freedom came at last. Well, joining me now is Pastor Carla Porter of Living Faith International, and we're so glad to have you here. Thank you, Terry. We're so glad to be involved with the work you're doing in Kenya. You know, Carla, when I first saw this story, um, I, what touched me so much was the ability of these children to communicate their pain and their mm. healing. Mm. I mean, that's astonishing. I see adults 
who don't get to that place. How did you help these kids come from brokenness and woundedness and a lack of self-esteem to a place of singing about the freedom God's given them? Well, Terry, I think one of the most important things is the anointing that God has given us, the spirit of adoption, mm -hmm. that we take them into our hearts as our very own children. We're not just, quote unquote, helping them. Caring for them, right. Caring for them, but we receive them into our hearts, into our church community, and love them as our very own children. And years ago, the Lord had shared with my late husband and me, don't just keep them alive, give them a life. Mm. And that brought such a change in our hearts that we stopped helping them and we began fathering and mothering yeah. them. They know they're loved. You know, you have to meet the needs of children, not just physically, physiologically, but you the, the need to be loved mm -hmm. and accepted brings esteem yeah. and they feel a liberty to communicate what's in their heart. They know they matter. How did the church wind up becoming aware of the need there and then stepping in? Well, we simply, uh, once a year in October, we as a church do community outreach. We look for needs in the mm -hmm. community and we make a special effort. And we w had been told about this orphanage and that it was in dire need. And so as one of our care groups in the church said, Pastor, we want to reach out to this orphanage. And that was the beginning. We found them in desperate need without food, without uh, proper sanitation, uh, terrible living conditions and very rejected by the community. And uh, we were told, well, no one will let us come to church. When we walk into a church, everyone moves away from us. Mm -hmm. So they had experienced tremendous rejection. And I told them, we would love for you to come to our church. And we began sending a minibus every uh -huh. Sunday to pick them up and bring them to church. And they would come hungry, dehydrated. They weren't clean. They they, you know, had terrible mm -hmm. odor and so forth. And we began to realize, oh, this is much deeper than helping an orphanage yeah. for one time. Mm -hmm. and, and eventually the government asked us yeah. to take over the orphanage. Talk about the power of education because mm -hmm. it creates a hope and a future that you don't really have without it. You don't. Uh, in fact, you'll be consigned to a life of poverty. You can rescue a child and leave them in the same circumstances, yeah. or you can rescue a child and bring deliverance in their life mm -hmm. from generations of poverty and lack of education. It's very important that you meet the physiological and emotional needs so that they begin to have self-esteem and realize I matter. But then what, where I'm focused after that is their destiny in God. Yeah. Because Jeremiah 29, 11 is for every orphan and every vulnerable child. Yeah. God has a good plan for them, but they need an education. Mm -hmm. And so I'm in the process of building Heritage Leadership Academy. The Lord has told us, raise up leaders for me. Yeah. And uh, with this academy, I will be able to offer them what we're not able to find in, in the school system yeah. in Kenya. You're, you're gonna change a nation with this. Oh, I, I, I received that, Terry. <laughs> I believe that. I give yes. it as a word. Praise God. Listen, I, you know, one of the things I see in the lives of every one of these children in that story is people who should have loved them, who should have cared about mm. them, were abusive to them. Yes. How do you help them walk through the forgiveness? Because that you can't get to the freedom they've gotten to without mm -hmm. being able to release mm -hmm. people who harmed. Terry, I tell them, you've had a difficult beginning, but we teach them the gospel. You've had a difficult beginning, but now with God, all things are possible to you. But the key 
to the power of God walking in your, uh, working in your life is for you to walk in forgiveness. Wow. And so we work with them in forgiving everyone from parents to other family members to uh, people that have been in their lives, all who have abused them. Yeah. Because without that forgiveness, you have an invisible barrier that prevents God's plan from being fulfilled. We want to thank you for what you do and for being here with us today. And I want you to know if you'd like to help children at Carla's Orphanage, our home, and be a part of the work Orphans Promise is doing around the world, then partner with us. Our number's toll free. It's 1-800-700-7000. And you can make a difference. You can make a difference. You can set people free. We want to leave you with a wonderful scripture from the book of Psalms today. Psalm 82.3, defend the poor and fatherless, do justice to the afflicted and the needy. Thank you for being with us today. God bless you.